In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Uh, not last week, because we didn't meet the previous week, um, through the kindness and uh, good work of uh, Jim and uh, Lisa, uh, we uh, looked at uh, the trial of uh, Socrates. And this evening, we want to look at <clears throat> And the important letter here is the letter S, the trials of Jesus, the trials of Jesus, because Jesus faces trials on two fronts, hmm? two fronts. Both of them represent the two leading, most powerful establishments uh, locally in Jerusalem and in the world. It is religious and ultimately it is political. It is religious and political that Jesus faces charges. Now, uh, the question naturally arises, if Jesus is going on trial, or trials, what are the charges? What are the charges? Uh, in other words, a bill of indictment. Now remember, a bill of indictment or an accusation uh, is, an a is just that, it's an accusation doesn't prove anything. It doesn't set out to prove anything. It says more or less that there's sufficient reason to proceed forward. It, th there's enough here to work with that it deserves um, to be heard in a uh, judicial proceeding, a formal judicial proceeding, etc. Whatever that may be, depending upon the jurisdiction, the locale, all that sort of stuff. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, question is, what is uh, religiously, let's, let's do that one first, because the religious one is the more, complicated, the more complicated of the two. Uh, the deeper one is the political. The more complicated one is that of the, uh, uh, of the religious, of the Jewish. Now, what is, what, what is Jesus charged with uh, religiously? Did anybody, look, we're Catholic, so I believe in miracles. Did anyone look at the catechism to see what, what they were? Because it's listed for you in the catechism. Did anybody look at the trial and all that in the catechism? No. Okay. Thank God this is not a seminary. <laughs> because you would have seen a very different me. Trust, trust me on that. Trust me on that. Very different me. But anyway... Take a breath. All right. <clears throat> let's, um, let's look at uh, beginning on number 574. 574. Number 574 in the Catechism. And uh, amazingly, if you just flip over to 595... Just keep your finger on the 5-7 because we've got to go with that. But if you look at um, five, uh, 595, you see there, 595 is just a few pages away. 595. You see there, uh, Jesus died. Do you see that? Yes. And then underneath that it says what? Yes, thank you. Okay, so that's there. See, right there for you. Right there. Right there. All right. Don't worry, I'll get over this in a minute. Um, takes, the older I get, the slower I get getting over these things. But anyway, all right. Um, we have to understand, as the catechism begins there, that from the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, certain Pharisees and partisans of Herod the so-called Herodians, 
uh, they were kind of uh, uh, priestly, but also political kind of mixture. They were a kind of Heinz 57 group of uh, priests and scribes. Uh, they set out to destroy Jesus. Do you have a catechism? Uh, no, where's uh, Do we have another catechism? We have them somewhere. No, wait, we haven't. We have them somewhere. Oh. Oh, all right. Okay. Uh, anyway, let's, let's move on. Um, you understand that from the very beginning, from the very beginning, uh, the fact that Jesus is born is a fact of problems and trouble. Okay? Go back to your Christmas stories. Go back to the Christmas stories. Um, what is the response by the religious authorities to the announcement that Jesus has been born? What is, what is the reaction? Very good. Immediately following the birth is the holy innocence, right? Herod puts out the order to go kill him. He tries to hoodwink the, uh, the uh, astrologers from the east to find out where he is and so on and so forth. So right from the beginning. But if you go to the Gospel of John, what does it say in the Gospel of John in the prologue? Look at the prologue, if you would, please. John 1 in the prologue. That's the prologue. If you look at the prologue. Yep. Great. Now what? <laughs> in the beginning what? Yes, okay. Yes, but where, 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 where do you think is the important point that we're looking for? In the prologue. It's only 19 verses. No. What are, we, what are we talking about? No. What are we talking about? What is the theme that I'm talking about? And, and what? Good. Okay. Very good. Now, where is that in the prologue? Is what I'm asking you. No, keep going. Keep going. Very good. Look at the net, look at the verse. He was in the world and the world came to be through him, but what? The world did not know him. He came to what was his own, but what? His own people did not accept him, right from the beginning, right there in the prologue. He came into the world, and right from the beginning, his own do not accept him. Herod is the prime example of it, right from the beginning. You know, we get all caught up in the Christmas story about, uh, you know, wise men, gifts, and all this other stuff. But what we fail to see is that the reaction of the religious authorities is not, oh great, the Messiah is here, welcome, all, welcome everybody. It's just the opposite. And that, that, that's a prologue. That's a prologue to the entire public ministry of Jesus. It's going to be opposition. And Jesus says to the disciples, no need to be surprised if the world hates you. Know that it has hated me before you. If you were of the world, the world would not hate you, for the world loves its own. But because you are not of the world, the world hates you. The centrality of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. You wish to follow me, pick up your cross, and die to yourself and follow me. Jesus says again, no need to be surprised if you have difficulty in the world, if you have trouble. But do not worry. I have overcome the world. See, 
So the idea that the Christian is, 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 is a fairy tale, or it's all, you know, blue skies, green lights, kumbaya, and, gut and, and guitars, is simply what Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great Protestant theologian of the last century, calls cheap grace. It's cheap grace. In other words, I want Jesus, but I want Jesus without a cross. I take Jesus at the resurrection, Jesus on Mount Tabor. I'll take Jesus when he's raising Lazarus. I'll take Jesus when he's doing all those wonderful things. However, there's always Peter lurking there. Because Peter is the chief protagonist or antagonist to what? What does Peter not want Jesus to do? Go to Jerusalem. Very good. Do not go there. Because what's waiting for you there, they have bad intentions. And a little self-interest. If we're following you, it's going to be bad for us too. Let, let us never forget us. Huh? Let us never forget us. So right, right from the beginning, this is here. It's going to reach its apex in Holy Week. All of this has been leading up to this. All of this has been leading up to this. The last three years, the last three years, is not a fairy tale. That's why when people say, well, all the scriptures are, you know, they're all this religion stuff and it's all sweet and this and that. I don't know what scriptures they're reading. And I, I have no idea what, what Bible they have. Maybe they got it from Captain Kangaroo. But, but it's not the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's for sure. And it's not the Christian life. So right from the beginning, you're going, to, uh, you're going to have this. So if we go back to the catechism, please, please. Jesus is accused, number one, of blasphemy. Blasphemy. And because the Jewish authorities want to co-opt the political authorities into the situation, they say he's also inciting the people. Wherever he goes, that's what he's doing. He's upsetting everybody. Because what is the central message of Jesus of Nazareth? What is his first preaching as he enters, as he enters um, Galilee? For the Galilean ministry, what is his central first message that he preached? First, first thing. Come on, folks, we went over this. Sorry, me? Very good. Why? Why? Why repent? Repent and reform your lives. Very good. Why? Because? No, no, no. What does Jesus say? You're exactly right. Present, present, repent and reform your lives for what is at hand? The kingdom. Did you hear the word kingdom? Now you know how well that plays with Caesar? You understand that? Because he's not to Caesar he is this is this is a threat. This is a geo this is a geopolitical military thing. This will, this will come up when Jesus and Pilate get in a confrontation over whether Jesus is a king. Huh? Jesus clearly makes, because that, that's, the th that's the thing. So the Jewish authorities say, what we've got to do is we've got to get the Romans in here. And why? Why do they have to get the Romans in? What... Why can't, what, what can the Romans do that the Jews cannot do? Kill him. Capital punishment is off the record for them. They do not want Jesus in prison. No, they don't want that. Why? You got a martyr out of him. You, you got to be kidding. They, they don't want this. Uh, no, they want him dead. But, but of course, naturally, 
being the uh, slimy little people that they are, they don't, they don't want to do it and they can't do it, so what do they do? They shield themselves in the law. They use the law as a cloak to hide their real intention. And that's always the way it works. Always get something respectable to hide the unrespectable. What is the first temptation? First temptation in, 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 in the Garden of Eden. Why, 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 why would Satan use that first? Why? Because what does the Bible tell us? No, no. Why, 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 would, why would you take that? Because it's what? No, what does it say? What does it say? It says, it is pleasing to the eye and good for food. My God, you go, you go to the store every day, I bet must, some of you do, and what's the first thing you run into? You run into the produce, exactly. They're not going to put a bunch of cans of dog food out there. I mean, come on. No. What are they doing? They're putting there that which attracts the eye, the senses, and food. Food is primal. Color to attract you, something primal that you need to live. Okay, so, okay, so, so that's what happens. See, if you saw evil in its ugliness, you would want nothing to do with it. You always wrap the unpleasant. You do that, well, you don't do it anymore, you're too old. But you once upon a time may have done it to your children. Uh, if you want them to take the castor oil, you give them a little honey. Or you put some orange juice. Except... If you had a uh, kind of parent, too bad. Hold your nose and swallow it. You know, that, that's what you do. But, 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 but that would invite a lawsuit of child brutality and everything else today. So, oh, don't, 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 even, don't even think about that now. Yeah, oh, uh, hmm. yeah. So... It, it, it's that. It, it, it's blasphemy. Now, now let's see. Now, look. Let, 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 let's be fair here. Let, 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 let's be fair. Do the Jews have a good case? Yes, they do. Yeah, they do. They have a very good case. Well, 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 wait. Let's start with. Wait, 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 wait. Get back on trigger a minute. Uh, you, you, no, you're exactly right. Okay. They don't believe that he is the real Messiah because the, the Messiah is the Son of God, sent by God, and so on and so forth like that, etc. Yeah. When Jesus says he is the Son of Man, the Son of God, this and that, and all that kind of stuff, but we're going to see what he even goes further than that. He really pushes the envelope. You'll see that in a minute. Uh, what is Jesus claiming to be? Son of God. Which means he is what? He is what? He's God. He is God. You can't find a religion at that time or since that's more monotheistic than Judaism. What is the first commandment? Keep going. Can't have others. And don't hit me with this Trinitarian God and all this other kind of stuff. They don't know anything about that. And I guarantee you, you can go to seminaries and theology schools and ask them to explain the Trinity. Tell me about it, okay? Uh, well, well, no. Because mo most people walking around are polytheistic. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But they're all one. Huh? What? How, how is that? Say, so, St. Augustine wrote this big book, big gigantic book, uh, called On the Trinity. 
big, big book. And Augustine was perplexed by this idea of the Trinity. And the story goes, he was walking along the Mediterranean, Northern Africa, Ipo and all this kind of stuff, walking along. And he's thinking about it. And he, he wants to understand it through reason. He wants to figure this out now. So he's walking and he's meditating and all this. And there's this little kid a ways away, and he's got a shell in his hand, one of these seashells, so on and so forth like this. And um, he has a little bucket or container next to him. And as the waves come onto the shore, the kid has taken the shell. You've seen those, sea, those seashell kind of thing. And the kid has taken the water, and he's putting it into the bucket. And he's doing it, and he's doing it, and he's doing it. And this, this fascinates Augustine. Yeah. And he goes over and he says, uh, what are you doing? And he says, oh, I'm putting the Mediterranean into the bucket. And Augustine said, you stupid little boy, don't you understand that you can't put that big... Uh, see into that container and the little boy is reported to have said and don't you understand stupid man you can't put the trinity in your little mind <laughs> and when augustine was taken back and looked the child was gone now believe it or don't believe it ripley or not okay but the point is well taken it's a question of mystery See, we don't like mystery because, you know, we're all analytic and uh, we run all of our lives by analogs and, you know, Lincoln logs and all other kind of logs, you know. Everything's a log now. Used to be megabytes. The only thing I knew was mosquito bites. But anyway, you have all that stuff. Uh, so uh, we, we have this. That's, that, that's, that, that's the thing right there. Uh, he, he is... He is claiming to be God. He's claiming to be God. Well, I mean, right off the bat. Uh, secondly, um, he violates the law. He violates the law. The greatest sermon ever preached. Greatest sermon ever preached. It's the Sermon on the Mount. Chapter 5, 6, and 7 in Matthew. If you would, please, look at Matthew's Gospel. 5, 6, and 7, please. You can keep your hand, you, you know, whatever you got. Just flip it to Matthew. Take a look, please. Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, 6, and 7. For the sake of discussion, um, let's look at uh, chapter 5, verse 21. Make it simple. 5.21. Okay? Everyone there? 5.21. You have heard that it was said to your ancestors. Now, who are they referring to? Who? Who said it? Moses, that's right. We're dealing with the Mosaic law here. You've heard it said, you shall not kill, whoever kills is liable to judgment. But I say to you, what? And you go through these, go, go through these, you know, uh, adultery, divorce, uh, oaths, retaliation, enemies, uh, you know, all of these things, the formula is simple. You have heard it said, but I'm saying to you, wait a minute, who are you? You, you? You're giving us a new law? You're replacing the law of Moses? On Mount Tabor at the Transfiguration, who appears with Jesus? Elijah and Moses. 
You getting rid of him? You getting rid of the Mosaic law? You're not challenging that? Are, are you crazy? I say you want to be God. You're challenging the law. You, you're replacing it. Re, read that uh, beginning of that uh, section there in chapter 5. How does it begin? Do not what? Right, right, right there, right underneath the adultery or above it. What does he say? Do not think what? No, no, above, above that. Go, go, uh, go above it. What does it say? Do not what? No, 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 no. Look, look at. Uh, no, no, above it. No. All right, let's see. Let me find it. Let me find it. Look at 517, uh, please. Yes. Do not think I have come to abolish the law and the prophet. Do you think they heard that? Of course not. I don't want to hear that. Uh, I have come... Uh, <laughs> I've come to complete them, to perfect them. I've not come. I've come to fulfill them. They didn't hear that. We're wonderful at selective hearing, aren't we? They just had a two-hour meeting over there. Ask the people to repeat it. What were the salient points? I'd love to hear that. No, I would not love to hear that. I take that back. I know, I take that, I take that back. Um, so, and, and it goes through these things. Well, Jesus, Jesus is up there, and he's saying it. You know, you have heard it said, but I say to you. You have heard it said, but I say to you. Wait a minute. Well, what about this power? Mm -hmm. He's already discredited. We, we didn't hear that. We, that, that. That was hit on the erase button. He wants to be God, claims to be God. He's now replacing Moses. What else does he replace? Central, cent, central, to, central to Jewish life. What does he replace? What's central to Jewish life? No. We've already gotten rid of the law with Moses. Huh? No? What? The what? Not the synagogue, but the... Not the synagogue, but what's the other? The big thing. The temple. Yeah, you are familiar with that. The, the temple. When Jesus stands in front of the temple, and what does he say? He'll destroy it. Oh, in three days, I'll rebuild it. And what do they say? Yes. How can he do this? You see what I'm saying? The temple, monotheism, the law. The law. And, well, what about the prophets? Can't leave them out. What does he do with the prophets? And how does, he, how does he plan on fulfilling them? How, how, how do they think they fulfill the prophets? What, what's, the, what's the standard way up until the time of Jesus to fulfill what the prophets have said? What, 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 why do the prophets come? Why do the prophets come? Why, why, why is the prophet coming to bring the word of God? Very good. That's right. They're not doing it. That's right. Exactly. They're not doing it. So how do they correct that, uh, Maria? No, you're exactly right. You are exactly right. Now, that ought to sound familiar to you people. 
How many times do people walk around the street or in the bathroom and say, there ought to be a law? Well, read uh, Supreme Court Justice's uh, Neil Gorsuch's new book. You know, too many laws. Somehow the law, just pass another law. It fluctuates, but the murder capital in the United States is Chicago, Illinois. Now, and we can quibble about all of the statistics, but it goes back and forth, okay? But it's up there. Let's put it that way. My God. Now, the question is, you have people who want to have more gun laws. There is no city in the United States that has more gun laws restricting guns and everything else than Chicago, Illinois. Now, am I suggesting we should do away with gun laws and just go back to the Wild West? Of course not. Nobody's saying that. That's the fallacy of the reductio ad absurdum. Take your opponent, reduce it to the absurd, then you would dismiss it. No. What I'm saying is there has to be something more than simply a law. But that's what they said. What does Jesus say? What does Jesus say? That, 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 that messes up both the temple and the law. What does Jesus say? And, and how, how will he fulfill that, Maria? No, how, how will he fulfill it? What, 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 what does he say? What does he say? He doesn't say that, but um, what does he say? He quotes the prophets because, you see, there's a conflict in the Old Testament which is not appreciated. There's a prophet, there's a conflict between the priestly class and the, prop, and the prophets. What is, what is the way to do it if you're a member of the priestly class? What's that? The priestly class. What do priests do? Let's keep it clean. What do, what, 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 what do priests do? What is their official function? What, yeah, what, what is all of that called? What, what do they do? What, what, what do priests do? Okay. No. What, what, what do priests do? The whole, what, what, when you gather on Sunday, what is it? No. You're so Protestant, Maria. No. No. What, what do we do? What, what is, what are we gathering for? What is that? Praise God. No one has told you this. You have received this from our Heavenly Father. Yes, that's right. It is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. It's the holy sacrifice of the Mass. It's first and foremost a sacrifice. We need to understand it. All this idea of uh, let's meet and greet and, you know, how you doing? And uh, oh my God, spare me all that, please. The only reason you're there is because of a sacrifice. That, that's the bottom. Look, if Jesus Christ is not sacrificed, there is no Mass. There is no Mass. So forget that. And the idea that somehow this is a, oh, a, 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 a social thing, like you often see when you have the sign of peace. People, people how are you doing? How are you feeling? Oh, good, great, fine. Could you please stop doing that? This is not about giving me your medical report. It's about extending the peace of Christ. And how did that peace come? Through the sacrifice of the cross. When we say to somebody, the peace of Christ, we're not saying my peace. Again, the choir hates me for this. I'm not too keen about them, but okay. So there we are. But the idea is, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Are you crazy? Let it begin with me. You don't want peace to begin with me. I know I don't want it to begin with you. 
Peace cannot begin with me and it cannot begin with you. Peace is a gift. And it's a gift that flows from the cross. What is the first gift of Jesus on that first Easter night? What does he say? What does he say? No. What? What's that? There you are. And he says it three times. Peace be with you. What is the thing that bunch most needed on Easter Sunday night? Not a lecture. Not a video. Not a theological tome. What did they need? They needed the... They needed the peace of Jesus Christ resurrected. What is the feast? What, what do we celebrate today at Mass? As what? Queen of Peace. Yeah, Queen of Heaven, Queen of Peace. Yeah? yeah. Christ the King. Christ the King. But it's not a kingship like they were talking about. Very different. See? So these things fit together. So Jesus quotes Isaiah and quotes the prophets. What I, I do not want your animal sacrifices. What, what is this? How have, how have the Jews all these thousands of years been honoring God liturgically. What have they done? Sacrifice the firstborn. Sacrifice the firstborn. I've got, I hope I'm never. Thanks. Well, I hope you got my mother. Oh my God! I, I, I wouldn't get very far there. Uh, uh, oh my Lord! Oh my firstborn. Okay, sorry. <laughs> you, sorry. If only you had waited. No, no, you had to come out first. Huh? I mean, what is going on here? We have a homicidal maniac back there. Uh, be careful, Marie. You might want to move a chair or two over. Uh, no, no. We want to do the. We want to do the firstborn. What? What? With sacrifice. In, in the Old Testament, what are they offering? Animal. Yeah, specific animals. And if you don't have animals, what did you offer? The first fruits of the harvest. Yes. God gets the first. Yes, God gets the first. God doesn't get the fourth or fifth or second. God gets the first because all belongs to God and comes from God. You remember the scene between uh, one of the most poignant scenes in the whole of Scripture? Abraham and Isaac. Hmm? Abraham and Isaac. It's the cornerstone of the great philosopher Soren Kierkegaard's entire existential philosophy, fear and trembling. Fear and trembling. What's, what's the deal with Abraham and Isaac? Well, tell, tell me the story. Well, tell me the story. Okay, why? Why? God asked him to do. How does that strike you? Kind of strange. It's, it's disgusting. Well, well, wait a minute. We, we, Roy, we, we, have to, we have to take your uh, five hour away from you. Uh, wait a minute. Now, you're right. But the point is, let's look at this. Um, what, is this what is the condition of... Uh, Abram and Sari. What's that? Which means? Old and childless. That's right. Barren. That's right. She's a biological desert. That's right. Yeah, biological desert. Desert's a very important place in the Bible. A lot of things take place there. That's what happens. And what happens then? What happens? Who? No. God, and what else does he do? Abram becomes and Sarah Sarah new name what does that mean? 
What does the name mean in the in the Bible? New person. A new person. Not only a new person within you, but you're now a new person. You've been given a name. See, once upon a time, when you got uh, baptized and confirmed, you actually had a Christian name. Not uh, Tiffany and uh, Waldo the Third and, and all of these goofy names and things like that, which are just bizarre. But nonetheless, you know, okay, Bond, it's wonderful. Uh, no, you had that because you wanted to identify to the point where you became like that person in their virtues, in their holiness, in their closeness to God, and so on and so forth like that. Now, so they're given a son, and not only are they given a son, what are they given with the son? What are they given with the son? Very good, Maria, very good. They're given a promise. That what? That they will populate the earth for Very good. Very good. Exactly right. Not only a son, and not only life, Sarah and Abraham. This is going to be really big. God's got big plans in store for this child and for these two. I mean, you talk about, I mean, that's, that's a big promise. Ooh, man. And then what happens? No, God doesn't ask him. God tells him. Go and say, do you, real, do you realize how crazy that is? Oh, Sari and Abram, all up in age and everything else, barren like a, like a dead desert. God comes, gives him a new name, gives him uh, a son, and a promise. And now this crazy God says, oh, by the way, I want you to go kill the child. I mean, Kierkegaard takes that and develops his entire existential philosophy. The father of modern existentialism, Kierkegaard. Wonderful book. You should read it. Uh, Fear and Trembling. Great, great book. Okay, leaving that alone. Uh, it makes no sense. At the rational level, it makes no sense. In fact, it makes God out to be a monster. Pure, pure and simple. And if you don't like that, at least it makes him out to be very fickle. I'm going to do this. No, never mind. Kill him. How do I square that circle? Well, if he kills him, what happens to the promise? Because he made it to him. The promise is null and void. So God, God not only does all of this, he makes promises, but by the way, he doesn't keep them. I mean, this, this, this is a dizzying thing. I have to understand that. So they proceed. And they're proceeding to do what? The, the son asks him. What, what, what does Abraham say? He says, where is the sacrifice? Where is the sacrifice? He said on the mountain. Where, where, where is it? And... Uh, and, 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 and what does he, what, what, what is that? Deus probitas. God will provide. God will provide. That happens to be true. <laughs> Little does Isaac know. He's the main event. Huh? He's, he's the only item on the menu. And he goes there. You got, you got to try and place yourself in the position of Abraham. No child with Sarah. None. And remember, to be barren, unlike today, to be barren was a reproach. And it's called a reproach. They, they looked upon it as a reproach. It was somehow God inflicting some kind of punishment or limitation on you, or at least somebody in your genealogy who really aggravated God, and he's getting you. 
So you're not getting you're not getting one. Okay. And it and it talks about it. You know, it's the reproach. Elizabeth says that God, God has remo removed my my reproach. Okay. They get there. And uh, what does Abraham proceed to do? He gets the what? The wood. He gets the, the wood of the sacrifice. What does that remind you of? See, you have to make these connections. See, this is the whole, this is the genius of scripture. See, we don't have that mindset, unfortunately. We don't. We don't, we don't see how these things are connected. You see, this, this is, that's why, uh, unfortunately, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about like seminarians and training a priest, etc. We don't have that today where we should be reading the church fathers. Read the, read the sermons of the church fathers. Read the theology of the church fathers. The way they're able to make these connections the way they're able to, it's simply, it's stunning. It's stunning. And, and, and we really don't do that. He's going, to take the, he's going to take the wood. And Isaac is going to be the sacrifice. Pleasing to the Father. I mean, Ray Charles could see this. Huh? So you see the connection. And as he's getting ready to do old Isaac in, what happens? Angel intervenes. And what follows after the angel intervenes? They find the ram. God did provide. There's also a deeper lesson for that particular time. Was there such a thing going on at that time by child and human sacrifice? What does Abraham's story teach us? What, what does it teach us about that situation? There's, there's, there's human sacrifice going on, so on and so forth. Abraham is ready to kill Isaac. God intervenes and provides a ram. What, what message is God sending about human sacrifice? Come on. It's prohibited. Don't do that. Stop. Stop. God, God, God does not want that. You see, the, 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 again, if we under, we've got to place these things in their context and see we're constantly throughout Scripture. There's an elevation of moral and religious consciousness and an education of conscience throughout. Even with, uh, even with Cain and Abel. Cain, Cain does in, in bro, huh? Does him in. Okay. He gets a mark on him. But what does God say? He's not to be killed. You don't you don't make amends of innocent blood spilling by spilling more innocent blood. Even the blood of somebody like Cain, who is anything but innocent. Blood for blood does not work. And back then, everything was a blood oath. That was just the precursor to the mafia. Huh? Okay, they all could have been members. I don't know. Well, yeah, they had some Jewish mafia people. Okay. So, Jesus is, Jesus is doing all of these things, and what two other things does Jesus do that really riles all of the religious, uptight, upright folk? Very good. He violates the Sabbath. Remember? He cured somebody on the Sabbath, and what did they do? Oh, my God, don't you? And Jesus says, which one of you has a jackass? <laughs> like them. 
Which one of you has a jackass that falls into the cistern or into the thing, and you don't get him out? You wait till uh, a Sunday or Monday. Or there's no answer. Or the disciples uh, are hungry, and they go there, and they start the, with the corn. And, and, and Jesus says, oh, didn't you read where David and his uh, uh, army troop and so on and so forth went into the Holy of Holies and, and ate the altar bread? And that wasn't held against them. You say, oh, oh. I mean, ritual, law, liturgy, temple, monotheism, and what else? The same thing that will, same thing that could, uh, in a way, relate to Socrates. What does Jesus do that just really irks them? I'm trying to pull that in some kind of way, but I'm having difficulty. You know. Wonderful. Roy, see? I just had to tame you a little bit, Roy. That's all. Excellent. No, no, that, that no, you no, you no, you're much more of a gentleman. You're much more of a gentleman than I am. Uh, which is not setting the bar very high, I know. See these two are going, Well, I had big deal there. You know. You two need to be separated. Anyway. Uh, and um, he associates with all the wrong people. He's there with harlots and prostitutes. He's there with publicans and sinners. He's, he's getting rid of, you know, he's uh, telling sinners their sins, and their sins are forgiven. And they say to him, who can forgive sins but God? You are claiming, in effect, to be God. Only God can do this, and yet you're saying, go, your sins are forgiven you. You see, I mean, again, let's, let's step into the place of the Jewish authorities and Jewish people, etc. Uh, there's a strong case there. I mean, they, 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 there's a lot of things there to, to uh, explain. So it's not simply, you know, oh, they're all evil and bad and this and that and so on and so forth. Because there's a lot of division within the Sanhedrin over Jesus. Nicodemus is one of them. Nicodemus speaks up because he, he was no longer a disciple in secret. When it finally came to the Sanhedrin, Nicodemus spoke up on behalf of Jesus. The Jewish uh, scribe and lawgiver, Josephus, speaks up on behalf of Jesus. You see, so there's a lot of it's not simply a unanimous decision, okay? But these these are the major these are, these are the major elements in the bill of indictment against Jesus. I mean, and it's pretty hefty. It's pretty hefty. So if you look there again at uh, <clears throat> five seventy six, uh, you see there, uh, and. If you turn the page or go to 577, all the way down, Jesus and the law, Jesus and the temple, Jesus, faith in one God and Savior, and so on, uh, you see clearly, see clearly, uh, and, and, you, and you should read that. You should read that. You're not gonna, I'm not going to read it to you. Uh, and that, that, that will explain in more detail, flesh out, the various elements of the charges brought against Jesus by the Jews, by the Jewish establishment. Okay, by the Jewish establishment. Now, so, and we need now, if you would please, to turn to Luke 22. Turn to Luke 22, please. Mm -hmm. 
Ooh, 22, mm -hmm. 66. I think that's 66, yeah. Luke 22:66, please. And that is that is what? What episode is that? 22:66, please. Huh? And what is the Sanhedrin? It's the ruling authority. It's the Supreme Court dealing with matters of religious law and also civil law that does not involve Rome. That does not involve Rome. Their own kind of law or customs or whatever they have. Yes. It, yeah, we're going to see in a minute. Yeah, it'll give you the composition of the body of the Sanhedrin. The Pharisees teach the scribes of the scholars the Sanhedrin is the supreme judicial authority on questions of what is uh, proper and what is improper, what violated the law, what didn't violate the law, etc. It's a body headed by the chief priest. Headed by the chief priest. Okay? Think of it as a kind of uh, grand jury, but they can administer. They have, uh, they have um, guilt and innocent, and they can enforce it. Not like this grand jury that we have, which simply advances whatever the district attorney wants, and so on and so forth like that. So let's look at this, please. 2266. Is everyone there, please, who wants to be there? If you don't, you're dismissed. Never mind. When day came, the council of elders of the people met both chief priests, scribes, and they brought them before the Sanhedrin. They said, if you are the Messiah, tell us. Okay. In other words, now, for we moderns, we would say, uh-uh, no, 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 that's right, right off the bat, we got a problem. Uh, and some of you would probably bring up the Fifth Amendment. They're, they're asking him to self-incriminate. Tell us. Okay? Also, he's not represented by counsel. Hmm? The ACLU is not there. He replied to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. If I question you, you will not respond. And that's very true. In the scriptures, how many times does Jesus, uh, you remember, remember when they accused Jesus of casting out a devil by Beelzebub? Does anybody you remember that or no? You don't. Don't you remember that when, when Jesus is casting out and they accuse him of being possessed and casting out devil? devil? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. And, uh, and uh, Jesus says, well, then if I cast it out by Beelzebub, who do your people cast them out by? And what's their answer? No answer. They have nothing to say. Huh? So, he's saying, you know, I ask you a question, you won't answer it. You want me to answer a question that's going to incriminate me. And I've already answered these things. I've, I've spoken openly. I haven't hidden anything from you. But you still don't believe. Um, but from this time on, the Son of Man, there, there is the most frequently used designation of Jesus in the Gospels. It's used 83 to 84 times. Uh, the second is the Son of God. Then there is Messiah, Lord, etc. But that's the most frequently used one. And we indicated that the Son of Man is what? Son of Man is what? Is who? What, what, what figure does the Son of Man represent? Well, what is the Son of Man? Uh, 
is it capitalized or is it um, it's capitalized, isn't it? Is there a son of God that's used in the lower case? Yes. What does it mean? What's the lower case mean? Why why is one capitalized? Why is one lower case? I mean when you see that, that, that should, you know, why why is that? Why? Why? What does it mean to be a son of God? No, what does it mean to be a son of God? No. No, no. What is the son of God? To be a son means to be what? Well, part of the family. Now, when we say son, don't get all exercised here. We're talking about men and women, okay? Let's, let's not get all beside ourselves. Um, the designation that's used by the Romans is what? To indicate relation to Caesar. You're going to hear it in a minute, so what is it? Friend of Caesar. Friend of Caesar is a... Is a if you wanted to, if you wanted to be introduced to the mafia, and you were brought in, and nobody knows you, and you're not too sure, you'd say, "This is so and so." Uh, then, if you got to know him a little more, you'd say, "This is a friend of mine." Now, when you say "friend of mine," you're on the hook for this guy. Okay? Because whatever he does, you're responsible. And whatever he gets, you're going to get too. But more so, because you're supposed to know better. And finally, if he's in, he's a friend of us. He's one of us. Uh, Cosa Nostra. Cosa Nostra, translated, means our thing. It's our thing. The thing that we have. That we don't talk about, but we understand. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? Hmm? That's Cosa Nostra. It's our thing. It, it's all that involves in being in the mafia. So that's what it means. Cosa Nostra. Our thing. Um, so the Son of God. What does the Son of God represent? What does it represent in the Old Testament? There's only one place it appears. I told you that before. The book of Daniel. Only one time. Only one time in the Old Testament. What does it represent? Son of God. Son of man. Son of man is that eschatological figure that appears when the Messiah is now present. So, when Jesus says, the Son of Man, what is he saying? Yeah. He's the Messiah. See? All right. So let's keep going. Don't, don't despair. Don't despair. I'm not. I'm not. I'm hanging in there will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. That's a clear reference to Daniel. They all asked, Are you then the Son of God? Notice, please, what has happened. They changed it how. And what does that mean? So what? So what, uh, Miss Betty? So what? So what? Oh, wait a minute. What, 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 Betty, why, why, why? We're coming back to you. Huh? Come on. Son of God. Why have they upped the ante? They, 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 they have elevated the thing, haven't they? Okay, I'm asking you why. 
Why do you think they would do that? The son of... The son of man is that figure that appears signaling the Messiah. To call him the son of God is to say, there he is. There he is. See, very, again, little, just a little, eh, not, not a big deal. Well, it's a very big deal. It's a very big deal. Because now, now they really got him on a uh, class A uh, 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 blasphemy charge. You see? That's right. But again, he has no representation. He doesn't need any. Because he, he's constantly bobbing and weaving. He's giving him the Ali rope-a-dope kind of, kind of thing, you know, approach. Okay. So he says, <clears throat> uh, Are you then the Son of God? He says, You say that I am. Now, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Because he will say that to whom? Pilate, very good. That's right. You say that I am. Notice, notice how Jesus turns it back on them. You say that I am. <laughs> you realize, do you realize how Jesus is taking the knife and shoving it in them about how corrupt they are? Jesus is not saying, you say that I am. He's saying, you say that I am. In other words, he's, sly, he's slyly saying, are you confessing that I really am the Son of God? Is that what you're doing? Is that, is that what you're doing? Huh? Huh? Okay. That is, it's brilliant in its subtlety. It's brilliant in its subtlety. Then they say, notice that answer makes them reveal themselves how corrupt they are. What further need have we for testimony? We have heard it from his own mouth. They've heard no such thing. That's right. Talk about putting words in your mouth. I mean, this is a whole buffet. You see? There, 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 I mean, there, there it is. There it is. But, but... Let's go on. On hearing this, Pilate asked, um, I'm sorry, uh, the, next, the next part there, 23. Then the whole assembly of them, that's the whole uh, Sanhedrin crowd, arose and brought him before Pilate. See? See, folks, look. See? He's got to go to Pilate. Why? That's exactly right. Very good. That's exactly right. He's, he's, now, he's now going over to this guy. They brought charges against him, saying, We found this man misleading our people. Note, no, notice that. Misleading our people, meaning the Jews, by his teaching. All the things I just laid out for you as his bill of indictment. He opposes the payment of taxes to Caesar. He does no such thing. You remember the confrontation over the temple tax? What does he say? Give to Caesar. What? Anybody's got to go to the restroom. They have right here. You want to take a break? Because I want to finish this up. No? Okay. Let's go on. Um, Opposes uh, the taxes to Caesar. What, what time is it, Daddy? Okay, well, we got, we've got a few more minutes. Come on. Well, let's, let's get this done. Uh, opposes the payment of taxes to Caesar. He does not. He says, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, to God what is God. And remember when he gets the uh, coin out of the fish's mouth? He gives him more. 
it's worth more than the tax that they would have to pay. Yes. So th th this is nonsense. But it doesn't matter. You see it today. Say a lie enough, put it on the internet, and everybody believes it. And maintains that he is the Messiah, a king. He didn't say any of that. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? He said to him in reply, you say so. Notice that. Jesus keeps reflecting it back. What comes as an accusation is reflected back. You say so. Pilate then addressed the chief priest and the crowd, and he said, I find this man not guilty. Not guilty. Not guilty of the charges brought there in terms of being a king, sedition, and all of that. Pilate does not care five cents about their crazy religion, their crazy religious laws. That's why you all got the Sanhedrin, you got all of them. You go take care of that yourself. But they don't want that. Because they want Pilate to do what they, what they want done, but can't do. Right? Okay. But they were adamant and said, he is inciting the people with his teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee, where he began even to hear. Uh, and you see that it goes on from there. And notice it's, it's spreading like a cancer. It's metastasizing, this Jesus. But notice, notice they want to make sure they sprinkle it with the sedition, the challenge to Caesar, and so on. Always in the back of their mind, don't forget, they want him done in. They don't want a martyr. They certainly don't want a live martyr. Because that would even be worse. That's worse. Uh, so, we have this now. We have this. Now, let's just bear with me. Uh, because I want to bring up something to you. Um... Do I have that here? I have that here somewhere. Or did I put it back? E-M. Make sure I get this spelled right. I spoke it just a moment ago. Ego am I? It's Greek. It means I am. I am. That is crucial in the Gospel of John. Remember, please, the Gospel of John is a legal document. It is a transcript. It is a trial record. It culminates in the verdict, and the verdict is handed down by the cross. By the cross. Throughout, this is the laying out of evidence for and against Jesus. Is Jesus telling the truth or are the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin and all of those people, are they truthful in saying that Jesus Christ is a fraud and a liar and he's just an opportunist like all the rest of these so-called pretending messiahs running around here now? Who's telling the truth? The truth 
Notice how often, when he first talks about John the Baptist in the prologue, what is John's function? Chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. Go check it out. See, when, see, when you get used to it, you, 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 the Bible loves that. It's like you're friending it. You, you know what I'm saying? Hmm? No, no. What is, how, does he, how does he talk about... Wait, wait, say that. He came for testimony. Who gives testimony? One? A witness. Let me, I said this is a legal document right from the beginning. And when does he first give his testimony? Wonderful, Maria. Excellent. How? That's right. And Elizabeth confirms it. Elizabeth confirms it. Right, right there. He came to give testimony. But his testimony is, doesn't begin in the Jordan. It, it begins in the womb. See? Right, right from the beginning. Yes. So, you know, I mean, read, read John with the idea that this is a document and it is basically a transcript and you, you are the jury. You are the jury. You have to decide for yourself whom do you believe. That's it. If you want Jesus to force you, you're going to see you, you got the wrong God. That doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. See? You have to decide that. So, um, this I am, ego am I, Greek, meaning I am. Why is that significant? Because Jesus, that's very important in the fourth gospel. Because Jesus dares to talk about the I am. Why is that significant? But why is that really, that's really significant? Why? What is that? Wonderful. Yes. Exodus chapter 3, please. Exodus chapter 3. Just bear with me a few minutes, folks. We're almost there. Then we'll take a recess and you can go home. As long as you don't talk about it to anyone. Which I have no fear of that. <laughs> uh, anyway, you don't need to be sequestered. <laughs> I'm going to let it go, I promise. If you look at 3.14, please. Exodus 3.14. Well, you can really look at 11 to give you the context. 3.11, it's just a few verses above it. It's not going to kill you, I promise. 3.11. But when Moses, is everyone there who wants to be there? All right. When Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you. And this will be your sign that I have sent you. When you have brought my people out of Egypt, you will serve God at this mountain. But Moses said, notice that. See, he wants to give him a sign. You, I'm going to bring you out. We'll get here at the mountain. We'll do the worship and all that kind of stuff. And Moses says, ah, uh -uh. no, 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 no. Uh, Mo Moses, Moses has been around this rodeo a few times, huh? But Moses says, if I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they, and they ask me, what is his name? Now, God has been around the rodeo too. Why, why does Moses want to know God's name? Because he wants to worship him. Now, that, but, but spare me that answer. Uh, why? Why? why 
So what? Gives how? Why? Well, how how does that give you power? But, all right, I know your name, Betty. What power? What power I have over you? I'm more than important. I'm more than important to you. What? Why? Oh God! Poor you. I can control you. When the cop stops you, what does he want? Give me your identification. Give me your ID. Right? That's what he wants to know. He didn't want to know how you're feeling and all this other kind of stuff. Oh, I'm having a bad day. Too bad. You're going to have a worse one. Give me your, give me your ID. And if I know your name, well, why do you think people use aliases? Well, exactly. The word alias comes from the Latin alien, which means stranger. You are assuming a name, not your own, so that you will be a stranger. It's a powerful thing to give your name. Sign your name. They got some people sign their name on anything. And they live to regret it, or they don't live to regret it. They just regret it. But they did, they don't know what I got. Uh, no. Uh, see, Mo Mo Moses is crafty. Oh, yeah, there's all this mountain stuff and all of this uh, sacrifice and getting through the water and all that. That's all great, fine, wonderful. Um, you know, this is a God. If I could control that God, could you imagine? Could you imagine? Who was actually the most powerful person in the tribe? Don't tell me the king. Who was the most powerful person in the tribe? Huh? No, 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 Betty. No, no, Betty. I knew if I stayed at this long enough, Betty Crocker would would come out in, in her. Hmm? The leader, that's, that's, that's generic. I know. But who is the leader of the tribe? Who's the one that has the power? Yes, the witch doctor, the shaman. Why? What does he know? What does he know? What does he know? Why? How? How does he know God? What does the shaman or, 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 or the, uh, the witch doctor or everything do? What, what do they do? Wonderful. Beautiful. Roy, I tell you, I tell you, Roy, you know, I tell you, you just don't fix this up. You, you know, you got to watch Roy. He's, uh, he's sly here. Uh, yes. Um, he knows the names of the gods and he knows how to get a hold of them. See, you can be all wonderful and terrific, but if I need to talk to this person, if you need to talk to this person and I come and ask you and you say, well, I don't know, I don't, I don't know how to get in touch with I don't know how to get in touch with them. Uh, you're useless. Nice person, all that, wonderful, terrific, great, but uh, you're useless. And you can sit on the throne. And the one person you don't want to mess up with or mess with, contrary to uh, Betty, is forget the cook. Uh, you you don't want to mess around with the, um, with with the, the the guy who knows the potions, and everything else. Yeah, you don't want that. You don't want that. You don't want to fool with him. You know. Uh, so, uh, this idea of the name. See, God is not about to give. Moses, his name. The other gods have names, all these other things. Of course, those gods are idols and dead. They don't even exist, other than in the minds of these people. But this God is not you control God. God, God is revealing himself to you. God is revealing his will to you, his wisdom, his plan, not you to God. It doesn't flow that way. But 
But look, look, you got to give Moses credit. I mean, it's a good try. I mean, you know, hey, because he knows if I can get that, I'm going to get it. I, I, I'm, I'm okay. So let's keep going a little further. Come on, stay with me. Um, he says, um, go and say to the Israelites, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you. And they asked me, what is his name? What, what do I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Then he added, please pay attention to that. He then added, this is what you will tell the Israelites. That is the stupid pen. I am. That is my name. Now, that's in the book of Exodus to Moses. I, that answer is a polite way of saying, it's none of your business. I'm not telling you. And uh, you're not going to know it. In a more polite way, in a more polite way, because I'm sure God was very polite. It is supreme being. And what is being, back to our first philosophy discussions, what is being? What is being? It's existence. Existence, alive. God is the supreme source of all that is. Don't you say that on Sunday? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, you know, and then we rattle it on and go on to something else. But when we say that, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. You know, that, 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 that's how we start for which everything else flows. Because without that, you don't have anything else. If God is not the ground of all being, if God is not the origin, sustainer, and destiny of all that is, then we're no different than the dogs and the cats or anything else, and everything is up for grabs. Everything is chaotic. See? So he says, I am supreme being. Now, I'm going to end with this, but it's important for you to look at it, if you would, please, please. Uh, where is my wonderful little paper? Go to uh, chapter 8 of John, please, as an example. Where is my paper? What? It's the stupid paper. So many papers here. I've got to keep flipping this around. Go to chapter 8 of John. I didn't anticipate all this turning by me. Go to John... Uh, I tell you what, um, skip over, go to 18. It'll, it'll make it easier. It'll make it simpler. Go, go to 18. Sorry, go to 18. It'll make it simpler. And we can get, then you can go and all that. Go to 18, uh, 8. Well, yeah, well, you can go a little bit above that. Go, go a little bit above that to give you the whole thing of what's going on. When Jesus is arrested, Jesus is arrested. So go to 18, um, uh, verse 4. Start there. This is when um, Judas comes and they're going to arrest Jesus. Is everybody there? Okay. 
Jesus knowing everything that was going to happen to him. Now, what does that tell you? He's God. Very good. Very good. You already know. God is omniscient. God knows everything. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. So God is both of those. Knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, do you, do you see what, what just happened there? They're coming to arrest Jesus. And what happens? What? No, no, no. What does this say? Re read that carefully, Daddy. No, 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 no. Read that sentence. He's going out to them. What does that tell you? I'm sorry? No, no, folks. No, he's not accepting anything. What is he doing? But don't get upset by how I said it. Just don't get upset. Uh, sure you do. They're coming. They're coming. Who's coming for him? The authorities are coming. What does Jesus do? He goes out to meet them. What is that telling you? He's not afraid. Why? No, he's not accepting anything. What is Jesus? He is the supreme authority. He's not going to go gobble and hide and sneak away and go, Oh, well, I knew it when we my lawyer. No, he's not doing any of that. He goes out to meet them. He initiates. He makes the contact. He makes the move. Nobody, nobody acts on Jesus. Jesus is always in control. Jesus is always the one who takes the initiative. He goes out to them. Notice, he doesn't wait for them to come to him. You see that? Because he is... That's all I can say about it. I mean, if you don't get it, okay. But, but that, that's the point. He goes out to them. Already now, you know that there's going to be something special about this encounter. He knows everything that's going to happen. He goes out to them. He doesn't run. He doesn't hide. He doesn't grovel. He doesn't do any of those things. He initiates the encounter. God always initiates the encounter with man. Man does never initiate the encounter with God. It's always the supreme to the finite rather than the other way around. Okay. So, he goes out to them. <clears throat> uh, and um, he says to them what? Notice that. You see that initiative there? Who are you looking for? I mean, Jesus is asking them a question. Instead of them saying, who are you? Jesus says, who are you looking for? I mean, do you see that? I mean, do you see the attitude? Do you see the different flow of energy there? You don't. I mean, again, you know, okay. well, don't see it. Okay. Um, whom are you looking for? They answered him. In other words, Jesus has started the interrogation of them. Okay. Jesus the Nazarene. What does Jesus say? And it's what? What, 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 how is it presented in your Bible, please? In capital letters. What is that telling you? Just what happened? How was it portrayed in 3, uh, uh, 14? It was what? All caps. What are you now getting some clue to? It's not revealed at Exodus. That's the point of being I am. Now what's happening? 
he's now, look, at Sinai, Moses wants to know, what's your name? God gives him this double talk. I am. You're not going to know my name. I'm not going to reveal my name to you. Now at this hour of supreme conflict between good and evil, the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of man, Jesus says, who are you looking for? Moses said, what do, hey, what do I call you to these people? What happens in the garden? Jesus says what? Jesus says what? No. What is the... T t t yes, who are you looking for? Who initiated it? Jesus. Who initiated it at Sinai? Moses. Right? Come on, this is not science. Moses wants to know the name. He initiates it. At the garden, who initiates the question? Jesus. Do you see the difference? Yes. Yes. See, it's the difference. Now, it's not the human being who's initiating this, per se. It's Jesus. And Jesus says what? What's the answer, please? I am. But now... What is the difference between the I am at Sinai and the I am in the garden? What is the difference? Both capital, both same spell, whole thing. What is the difference, if there is one, between the two I am? What's that? What did you say? What did you say? Don't answer a question with a question. What is, what is the difference? Is there a difference? Is there a difference? What? No, stop right there. Is there a difference? There is none. You're right. There is none. In other words, what? What now, what conclusion do you now draw? Jesus is the revelation of whom? The revelation of I am. I'm not going to tell you at Sinai. When am I going to tell you and show you? Yes, and I'm ready in whom? In Jesus. You see that? Jesus is now the I am being revealed. Moses' question is now answered. Not like they thought it was going to be. In splendor and glory and power and all of this kind of stuff. David returning with all the glory and all the victories and all of that. They're looking for this guy to arrest him. There's your great I, I am. But throughout, throughout, let's go a little bit further. We're going to stop. Hang in there. Just a little further. A little, just hang in there. Don't, don't, get, don't get wild on me. Um, Um, I want to see if I can get these X by. Go back, go back to verse 5. Go back to verse 5, please. Um, I'm sorry, go, go, go one above it. Go to 4. Go to 4. Just one above it. Same chapter. Jesus, knowing that everything was going to happen to him, whom are you looking for? Jesus answered, uh, and uh, I am, 
they, uh, when he said to them, I am, what happened? What is that a sign of? Don't be afraid. Fear not, Betty. Uh, that's right. No, you're exactly right. That's what you do in the presence of the divine. You lay prostrate in, in worship. At some level, the crowd understands that they're now... What happens when Moses... What happens to Moses when he goes up the mountain? What happens to Moses when he goes up the mountain? What is he told when he first goes up the mountain? You're on holy ground. And he has to prostrate himself. He can't have those on his feet. They are repeating that. This is the sign that even these people who are there to arrest him have now become what? Yeah, then, well, they're now, they're now worshiping. They came to arrest, do you see this? I mean, they came to arrest him and now they're prostrate worshiping him. Yeah, I, the, 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 this is enormous. This is enormous, you see. This, this is another revelation that Jesus is the Son of God. Even from these people, they're doing this. And Jesus throughout will claim, I am. I am. All right, we'll stop. But I mean, uh, but you see, that th this is important because this is laying the groundwork for the encounter between Pilate and Jesus. You see, and all of it, you have to understand the background. Look, we can go through the thing and, and give you a, a half an hour of this and that and all that stuff. But that's what you want, fine. But I don't think it's respectful of you or the time that you're investing. So I think we have to go through these things. And rather than just have me splurt things out to you, if I ask you questions and I go, no, that's not you. Don't, yeah, don't, don't get all, you know, sophomoric. Uh, you'll, you'll survive. Look, look how well you've done so far. Uh, yes, you do. You do. And so do I. And so do I, by the way. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, let, 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 yeah, let, 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 let's remember that, too. Uh, uh, well... Let's, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's pray to Almighty God so you all can go home. I don't blame you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty and gracious God, I offer you glory, praise, and thanksgiving with all here present. We lift our minds and hearts to you and thank you for the grace of this time together. Not only did you fill our minds, but hopefully our whole being, that we may truly love you more dearly and closely, serve the church with greater fidelity, and above all, carry the gospel of Christ to those whom we meet every day in our homes and in our lives, our neighborhoods. All of that in your glory. Please protect us in our going home. Help us to arrive safely, and if it be your holy will,